different than uh, the insight of knowledge that came from the class was uh, very beneficial. So uh, I hope that you're able to uh, get something from what I have to say today. Although I am uh, not very intelligent, uh, I'm still smart enough to know that uh, there is no other shelter in this material world than uh, being in the association of uh, like-minded devotees. So uh, let me read this verse. Uh, chapter 15, text number 8. Saryam yad avyapnoti yachapi ukaram matisvara Drihidvai tani samyate by your gadhan ham eva sayat Sariam yad of yap no tea yet chapi ut karma tatis vara Grihidvai tani samyate Bayur Ghadhan Iva Sayat. Someone else? Sariyam Yad Abyop Noti. Yad Chapi Uttakarma Matishvara. Grihit Vai Tani Samyati. Vayur Gandhani Ivashati Saryam Body Yat Yat Masadhas As much as Have your Noti Gets Yat That which Cha, also, api, virtually, utkarmati, gives up, ishvara, the lord of the body, grihitva, taking, itani, all these, Samyati goes away. Vayu, air, Gandhan, smell, Eva, like, Asyat, from a flower. Translation The living entity in the material world carries his different conceptions of life from one body to another as the air carries aromas. Purport. Here, the living entity is described as Ishwara, the controller of his own body. If he likes, he can change his body to a higher grade and, if he likes, he can move to a lower class. Minute independence is there. The change his body undergoes depends upon him at the time of death. The consciousness he has created will carry him on to the next type of body. If he has made his consciousness like that of a cat or a dog, he is sure to change to a cat or a dog's body. And if he has fixed his consciousness 
on godly qualities, he will change into the form of a demigod. And if he is in Krishna consciousness, he will be transferred to Krishna Loka in the spiritual world and will associate with Krishna. It is a false claim that after the annihilation of this body, everything is finished. The individual soul is transmigrating from one body to another, and his present body and present activities are the background of his next body. One gets a different body according to karma, and he has to quit this body in due course. It is stated here that the subtle body which carries the conceptions of the next body develops another body in the next life. This process of transmigrating from one body to another and struggling in the body is called karsati, or struggling for existence. Namo Om Vishnu Badaya Krishna Prasthaya Bhutale Srimati Bhakti Vedanta Swami Tinamane Namaste Saraswati Devi Gauravani Pachadrani Nirvasesha Sunyavadi Prasthati Jasatani Jai Shri Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nichinanda Shri Advaiti Gadadhar Shri Vasudhi Gaur Bhakti Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare So once again I'll read the translation to this sloka the living entity in the material world carries his different conceptions of life from one body to another as the air carries aromas. So I normally prepare for class by writing notes to uh, stimulate uh, my mind uh, as I am getting older. Uh, so I, I, I'd like to begin now. So uh, one thing that we have to understand is that in this material life, uh, our minds are uh, always going to be uh, disturbed. Uh, the Bhagavad Gita states that uh, the mind can be uh, the best friend or it can be uh, your worst enemy. Things uh, we do. So as I was saying that uh, in these material bodies our minds are uh, always uh, going to be uh, disturbed. Uh, and uh, what is the reason for this? Uh, it's because uh, first of all the mind, the body, and the facilities that have been produced in this material world are all material. Uh, 
uh, but we are spiritual. Uh, the nature of matter is to go through uh, different transformations and eventually uh, deteriorate. In Christianity, they say from ashes to ashes and from dust to dust in such a way. Uh, but in whatever condition of life we may have uh, developed for ourselves, uh, we try to utilize those facilities uh, to, to find comfort or to, uh, to reap some kind of reward or pleasure or satisfaction. And uh, how do we do this? Uh, we do this through uh, the facilities of our senses. The sense of touch, smell, sound, hearing, taste, and subtly with our mind and intelligence. Uh, it doesn't matter in whatever body we have or in whatever condition of life uh, we may be in, uh, we are hankering after this uh, pleasure or this satisfaction. Uh, uh, Srila Prabhupada had uh, told the story of uh, how a man was enjoying himself in the forest the sweet sound of birds singing, uh, the fragrant aroma of flowers, and uh, the cool breeze blowing uh, through the trees. And he was walking and enjoying his surroundings. And suddenly, out of nowhere, a tiger appeared. And this tiger began to chase this man. And in fear of, of course, his life, he began running as fast as he could to escape from being eaten by this tiger. And uh, he came to a well. And to him, this well was his uh, haven for escaping the fangs and the claws of this vicious tiger. And fortunately for him, there was a rope hanging down from this uh, well. So he began climbing down this rope. Uh, and as he was climbing, he realized that it wasn't a rope at all, but it was a venomous, vim venomousness snake and he was hanging onto this poisonous snake with a growling tiger looking down at him in this well uh, his life was in great peril and then suddenly to his right or to his left he noticed that there was a hive of bees and they had made uh, some very nectarian honey. And what did the mind do in this precarious situation? It began to think, hmm, if I could get some of that honey, uh, it would be so nice. So this shows you how delusional uh, we are while we're here in this material world. This is uh, caused by ignorance. And our ignorance is thinking that we are these material bodies. Yes, I am this body. Now, uh, as we know, we just 
lost one of our dear uh, devotees and uh, tomorrow it may be me or it may be you you know it doesn't matter so age gender or any of these things uh, uh, they don't really matter so the object is that uh, we must learn how to uh, utilize the facilities that uh, Krishna has given us. As I mentioned earlier, the mind is the best friend or it is your worst enemy. So how do we make uh, friends with our mind? This comes when we learned to control the lower self with the higher self. Uh, what is the lower self? The lower self is the body, the gross physical body consisting of the senses and then above the senses is the mind and above the mind is a more subtle thing, intelligence. So if we want to go from ignorance to intelligence, uh, we have to utilize our intelligence and uh, evaluate every circumstance uh, that we come in contact with and understand that we are not really uh, a part of this material world. Uh, also, there are other factors in here that cause us uh, to be disturbed. Uh, we know Adi Atmic, Adi Bhotic, Adi Daivic. Uh, do, do, you, uh, do you know what these are? Uh, these are three types of sufferings. Adi Atmic is uh, suffering or sometimes pleasure that come from other living entities. Uh, Adi Bhotic is our mind. The mind causes us to be restless and disturbed and causes lamentation and hankering and uh, general discomfort. And Adidaivik is the demigods. Uh, now we're going through a very hot season uh, fortunately, soon the rains will come and it will cool. But when the temperature is 120, we have no control over that. We have to suffer. How many people live where there is no generator? Do, do you have a generator in your home here? Or you stay in Delhi? Oh, no problem. How about you? Huh? You have an inver inverter. Yes, but an inverter only turns a fan and a light. And it's 120 degrees. The fan is not going to be much help. So even in these circumstances, and in the wintertime, it gets very cold. So your inverter is not powerful enough to heat up the room or, or keep the heaters going. So, so we, in this way, we, we are forced uh, by the laws of nature to endure these uh, discomforts. Uh, but with intelligence, we can understand that uh, all of these sufferings and inconveniences that we are being confronted with uh, 
in our daily activities, they are only affecting the body. What does Bhagavad Gita say? That the soul cannot be burned by fire, moistened by water, or withered by the wind. So as long as our consciousness is absorbed in this body, thinking I am this body. So uh, the example is those that listened this morning to uh, Srila Prabhupada's class, uh, he talked about the man riding in a big fancy Rolls Royce car and the man on the rickshaw. So the man sitting in the Rolls Royce car uh, with the air conditioner blowing and uh, all the comforts of the soft cushions of that fine automobile probably driven by his uh, chauffeur uh, became so comfortable and confident of his surroundings that he began to identify himself with that car, oh yes. And the rickshaw driver working very hard in this scorching heat, driving his rickshaw back and forth just to make a few prices. The rich man shouting at him, get out of my way. You know, you're in my way. Or if for some reason the rickshaw bumps into the rich man's car immediately, you hit me, you hit me. But in reality, what happened was that this vehicle that this rich man was sitting in was struck by a rickshaw. But the man inside that vehicle, he was not at all uh, injured in any such way. So this is our situation here in the material world. Whatever happens to us, uh, and many of us have experienced uh, calamities physically in uh, these bodies, whether they be young or whether they be old. Uh, I myself have gone through uh, many, many physical uh, disabilities. I've had malaria, I've had, of course, jaundice, I had tuberculosis, uh, I had a, uh, a heart attack, uh, I have all of childhood diseases, uh, some, you know, chicken pox, measles, mumps, so many colds and things. Uh, I had a herniated disc, and I had a disease that uh, paralyzed me for one month where I couldn't move even one inch. Uh, but all through all of these uh, inconveniences, I, having a little intelligence, was observing these uh, abnormalities that were taking place. So in this verse here, uh, uh, Krishna uh, describes the living entity as the Ishwara. So we understand that Ishwara means what? What does Ishwara mean? Controller. Yes, uh, so in one respect, everybody here is an Ishwara. For example, in this room here, uh, Parvati Mataji, she is the Ishwara. If somebody gets out of line or 
uh, says something that she doesn't agree with, then they won't be invited back to speak again. So in this, in this way, she is controlling. But when she leaves here, then she goes outside and then there's a bigger Ishwara who controls her and may try and tell her what to do. She may not listen, but, and that's true for all of us. If you have a husband, uh, if you have parents, uh, we have government laws that we have to abide by. There are all of these who are Ishwaras, but uh, there is one Param Ishwara. And of course, that Param Ishwara is the supreme Ishwara that nobody controls. And uh, that's Krishna. But that could be even debatable because I think maybe Radharani may control Krishna in many respects. And so that's just my own uh, thing. So these are things that, uh, as I said, we have to learn to uh, contend with in this material life. The different sufferings that are there. And also we have the modes of nature, goodness, passion, and ignorance. And uh, there is an imbalance of these in our daily lives. Uh, from time to time, uh, we may be motivated to uh, perform some charitable or pious activities or have kind words for our friends or other living entities. Uh, so the mode of goodness is uh, becoming prevalent, but in the midst of our charity or our uh, acts of kindness, uh, something can happen and cause passion or ignorance to also uh, manifest themselves, show their faces, and cause mood swings between us. When we wake up in the morning, normally most people wake up in the mode of ignorance. It's early morning, you're opening your eyes, and you don't want to get out of bed, and then you're thinking, I'll just lay here and sleep. Uh, but, uh, not for devotees, no, we jump out of bed right away early morning to go to Mangalarti. But for the karmi, what is his motivation? Passion takes over, he's thinking of work. Oh yes, I must go to work, I must get money, I must provide for my family, I must get the essentials, the necessities, that I need to be comfortable in this life. I want many, many things. Uh, and there's a very nice verse uh, in the Srimad Bhagavatam, in the seventh canto, fifth chapter, verse five. Seventh canto is uh, about Prahlad Maharaj. Uh, Prahlad is speaking to his father, and he says, Tat sadhu mane surya varya dehinam sarasam mud viga dehiyam asad grahat hitvatma patam griyam ananda kangma vannam gatoya darinam asrayate. So, uh, the translation is, uh, Prahlad is speaking to his father. Prahlad Maharaj replied, 
O best of the Asura kings and king of the demons, as far as I have learned from my spiritual master, any person who has accepted a temporary body and temporary household life is certainly embarrassed by anxiety because of fallen into a dark well where there is no water but only suffering. One should give up this position and go to the forest. More clearly, one should go to Vrindavan where only Krishna consciousness is prevalent and should thus take shelter of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. So we know from reading uh, how demoniac Hiranyakashipu was. So he was described as a very gross materialist. So even if you uh, dissect his name, Hiranya means gold and kasipu means soft bed um, so this now is the mentality of the populace of the world hiranyakashipu there are so many little hiranyakashipus they want to have a soft bed how many have soft beds nice memory foam cushions and pillows and quilts for the cold winter nights and uh, who has gold you have some gold yeah so i i even have some gold so are we little haranya kashipus so it doesn't necessarily mean if you have these things you will be haranya kashipu but that is the mentality of the materialistic person. And Hiranya Kashipu was the uh, manifestation of those characteristics. But uh, on the other hand, uh, if we Take Prahlad Maharaj's name. Uh, uh, what does his name mean? Uh, it says, Prakritsat Rupena Aladha. So, what does Aladha mean? Aladha means pleasure. So, Prahlad Maharaj, he was always full a pleasure not like the materialist who is uh, searching for pleasure but only finding temporary pleasure like it's described the man who falls into the well with no water only suffering suffering lamentation we covet what we have and are in anxiety that it may be taken away from us and then lamentation when it is gone. So these are uh, the differences of mentality. Prahlad has eternal pleasure because his pleasure is uh, coming from the Supreme Personality of Godhead, his mind. What does Krishna say in the Bhagavad Gita? Always think of me. Uh, become my devotee. He says also, whatever you do, whatever you eat, whatever charities you may perform, do them as a service to me. And so, this is what a Prahlad Maharaj uh, told his father. And his father, of course, we know, became enraged that his son would have such uh, foolish ideas. His conception was that uh, 
we must find pleasure through matter. So he wanted to control the entire uh, universe. Uh, but within our hearts, uh, there is one uh, true desire, uh, and that desire is pleasure, but not temporary pleasure. Uh, we want ananta. Ananta means uh, that which has no end. It's eternal. So that type of pleasure can only exist between two things that are also eternal. Uh, the living entity, you and I, we are eternal even though our bodies age. Uh, it's described, Dihino ismen nyata dehe kumarayovanam jaratatate hantra pratris driratati nyate. The body will go through these transformations from boyhood to youth, from youth to manhood, from manhood to old age, and then leave that old useless body and take on another body. So all through these changes, uh, we are searching after pleasures. And our pleasures may change. As a young boy, uh, my pleasures may be frolicking uh, in the fields with my friends. As I grow older, it may be academics, or it may be uh, women, and it may resort into uh, drugs or alcohol and we find pleasure in these things, but in reality, all of these uh, materialistic pleasures, uh, they are temporary, and they don't give us the satisfaction that we really, really, really want. Uh, so Krishna, so kindly, through his representatives, have uh, provided us with uh, all of these uh, Vedic literatures. And these literatures are designed to do what? They are designed to uh, take us out of ignorance, out of this a foolish conception that I am this material body uh, and uh, show to us who we really are. So Bhagavad Gita, seventh chapter, verse 19, Krishna says, Bahunam janmanamante jana jana prabhajate Vasudevam sarvam miti sab mahatma sula dula. So this means that after many, many, many births, he who is actually in knowledge surrenders unto me, knowing me to be the cause of all causes and all that is. Such a great soul is very rare. So this bahunam janmanamante. So how many births have you taken? How many births have you? You are the youngest in this, this room. So this means that uh, you, you just died a little bit before us. So you, you had already gone through this, having an old, decrepit, useless body. And you, what did you do? You decided to give it up and take on another one. And now we are all growing older, whether we be man or woman. And uh, our propensity is to uh, become absorbed and attached to all of our surroundings. And we covet them. and. 
don't want to uh, let go of these um, material possessions, friendships, and that is why and what determines what kind of body we take in our next life. Uh, searching after comfort, it doesn't matter what kind of body you have, uh, we will do whatever is necessary to, to find some relief from uh, the adidaivic, adibotic, adiatmic. Uh, for me, when it's hot and unbearable, I go to my apartment, I turn on my air conditioner, and I make a nice cold Electra drink, sit down and drink, and the cool air is blowing everywhere. So I'm very comfortable. The dogs, if you see them, what do they do? They jump into the gutters, and they cover themselves with that filth and that dirty, uh, just like the pigs, who sw swish around all day long in the gutters in a slimy, dirty water. But what are they thinking? Oh, man, this is so good. I'm, I'm feeling cool now. And they get out of the water, and from wherever they didn't submerge themselves in the water, their bodies are covered with who knows what, black gook and slime. But what is going on in that creature's head? Ah, it's so nice. And we know the story of Indra. Indra is such a powerful demigod, uh, but uh, due to offenses, he was cursed to take birth as a pig. And when he was transformed into his pig body, first a little tiny piglet and suckling his mother pig's uh, teeth trying to get uh, whatever they secrete from their, well, I don't, I don't say milk. <laughs> well, it's a mammal, but it, it's, it's pig, pig milk, okay. It's not sold in any stores or dairy. <laughs> you don't make cheese from it either. <laughs> but anyway, he g began to grow and he went through these different uh, transgressions where his body began and before too long he was a big strong stout male pig and we know that the pig has such a voracious uh, appetite for sex so immediately he began snorting and sniffing out all of the female pigs in his um, sewer or wherever he was living and found those that uh, he was attracted to and through their union uh, they began to produce their own little pigs and soon he had two or three wide pigs and 50 or 60 baby little pigs, you know, snorting around him. But in the heavenly planets, uh, there's always conflict between uh, the demigods and the asuras or the demons. And Indra was a very important general and a fighter and the demigods uh, became uh, in need of his assistance to defeat these uh, asuras. So they sent uh, representatives, 
coming down on their celestial aircraft uh, to this uh, ungodly, unclean uh, environment where Indra was living, probably submerged up to his snout in stool water, uh, taking in the aroma of his surroundings. And they approached him, my dear Indra, offering their obeisances to him and uh, explaining to him their dilemma with the Asuras and asking him to come back. And he looked at them and with great surprise in his eyes, he says, how can I leave this? All of this. Yes, so this is our dilemma. And this is why we continue to remain in this material world. So that deep, dark, bottomless well with no water, uh, it's described is married life because progeny comes from union, attachment to your children, to your wife, to your grandchildren. Up until the moment you die, you want to be surrounded by your kinsmen, your children, your wife, your grandchildren, all of these, or even your pets, your dog. Oh, my little puppy dog, Snuffy, come here. Oh, yes, yes. Or if you have a cat named Fluffy, yes, Fluffy, come sit on my chest. Oh, yes, yes, you're so soft and so sweet. And then you leave this body, and we know what happened to Bharat Maharaj. He was the most magnificent ruler of all of the world, whereas his name was given, Bharatsvara. The whole world was named after him. And he was intelligent that when it was time, Vairagya, not Viagra, but Vairagya, he renounced and went to the forest. He went and gave up his opulence and began tapasya, austerities, strictness, studying the Vedas. But who is in charge of this material creation? That is Durga. And Durga is Krishna's representative. So they may say, oh, what's the oldest profession? And everyone says, oh, prostitution is the oldest profession. No, the oldest job, the one who has held that job longer than any living entity is Durga. And what is that job? That job is to delude you into thinking that it's a nice place to be. So stay here. And she has many tricks up her sleeves in which she uses in order to captivate you into wanting another material body. When she sees people who are serious, just like Bharat Maharaj, performing severe austerities, giving up already opulence, so these things she couldn't offer him. If someone says, oh, I'll give you 50 crores, you throw away your neck beads and your bead bag, immediately, open it, here you go. <laughs> I take it off and then sayonara. 
But for him, he already renounced the entire world. So what did she do? She thought for a moment, oh yes, he was a saintly king. He was so compassionate to all of his uh, citizens living in his kingdom. He made sure that everyone was provided for so nicely. So I'll use this in order to captivate him. And as we know from the story, uh, she called on a tiger to come and growl in a ferocious voice and frighten a mother, Doe, ready to drop her baby. And when this happened, the baby fell into the water and Bharat Maharaj, out of compassion, felt it was his obligation to rescue that doe and then nurtured that doe and his mind became so obsessed with thinking of the well-being of that doe, but if he had kept what he had been living and studying, he would have known that uh, for the soul there is never birth nor death. And if that baby deer fell into the river and drowned, the laws of nature say that automatically it would be elevated to a higher form of life. So we start out as some slimy little germ and through bahunam janmanamante, many, many births and deaths, we were a deer, we were a tiger, we were a tree, we were an ant. And in all of these, uh, without any of our own doing, we were awarded a higher birth. But now we have come to these bodies in this human form of life. And this is where uh, decision time must take place. And only in this life we can choose to stay here or leave this material world and go back home, back to God here. So that decision is up to us. Uh, it's telling us here in Bhagavad Gita how to be successful at that. And if you truly want to get out of this material world, uh, just simply follow the instructions that are very uh, clearly and vividly explained to us in Bhagavad Gita. So I'll stop here. Any questions and their comments? So, uh, just because you have... Sometimes, uh, they told us that we have to do those who have made us lots of sins, or those who have gone from those who have come to start with some They have to first go to hell, they have to take the yatma, and then after that they can pass away. No. Uh, the, the verse is saying is that how you live your life now, in this human form of life, is determining which form of life you will take in your next life. Uh, if you are a slovenly 
person who gorges on food and uh, eats insatiably uh, as man proposes, God disposes. So you can eat five japatis or whatever, but if you want to eat and eat and your room is full of litter and clutter and dirt and filth, Krishna will say, you like this? Okay, I'll give you a suitable body. So it's not that you only go up, you go down and up. It's like a yo-yo. We're going from demigod to pig, just like Indra. He was a demigod, one of the most powerful uh, demigods down to one of the most lowest of creatures. So this is why in human form of life we have intelligence. A dog has no choice. It is a dog. It will always act like a dog. But humans, they act like dogs. Sometimes you, you hear people talking with their dog. Oh, oh, come on. How are you? And so what, what happens when, when they're dying? They're, they're thinking of, of uh, Roscoe, their, their Irish setter, or their, or their dog. And so Bhagavad Gita tells us that whatever consciousness we leave these bodies in, uh, that will draw us towards a body to match that consciousness. So why does this society call itself Krishna Conscious? International Society for Krishna Conscious. Not dog conscious, not pig conscious, not Lakshmi money conscious, not sex conscious, but Krishna Conscious. So right now, most of us are unconscious. We don't know. So these books are teaching us how to wake up and become conscious, Krishna conscious. And then Krishna guarantees that if you leave this body and you're thinking of me, surely you will come to me. So, and he told Arjuna to say that, let it be known. So you, you say that because Krishna's been known to lie. Sometimes he tells little lies, you know, we know that with the gopis and other things, he's, he's told many lies. So when he has his devotee make this declaration, then it must be upheld. So Krishna cannot go against his pure devotees. And so they tell us that by... See, I did something wrong. There's only one thing that of can control. The that, that's right. However, he's controlled by the love of his devotees and therefore he's not the word bhakti. That's so right. That's, that's right. the main reason because he is controlled by the love yes. of his devotees. Yes. That's, that's true. We, we hope that we have that devotional concept so that we, as well, it's just, it's just like when Lord Chaitanya appeared. He wanted to know 
how was it possible for someone to love me so much? So he came in that mood of Radharani and he preached how to love Krishna. So that's true. Love, love can conquer all, even God. But not love for dog or love for anything within this material world. It has to be love on that transcendental platform. So thank you all for coming. Hare Krishna.